uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, my name is Sohil Sood, a pediatrician at the University of California, San Francisco. Welcome to our ongoing Global Child Health Lecture Series. It's my absolute pleasure this morning to welcome Dr. Lisa Patel uh, to the, the stage uh, this, this morning or the virtual podium. Um, she'll be discussing climate change, health, and equity. And uh, Lisa is a clinical assistant of uh, Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford uh, School of Medicine, uh, and also serves as Deputy Executive Director, as is noted here, of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Um, she, uh, prior to obtaining her medical degree, if I'm recalling things correctly, she worked for the Environmental Protection Agency um, of the United States um, and also has a master's degree in environmental science. And so really comes at this from a, a breadth of knowledge in terms of the policy landscape, the health landscape, being a practicing uh, a pediatrician. Um, and uh, having known her uh, for close to a decade now, equity is really at the core of her mission and mantra in life. And so very excited to hear um, how she's tackling these, these uh, important and big issues around climate change, health and equity. Lisa, yeah. thanks. It's, it's really fun for me to get to do this lecture every year because I was actually a graduate of, of this program. I did my residency at UCSF and I was one of the Global Health Fellows. So it's, it's really fun and an honor for me to get to come back and teach. Um, so... The objectives of my talk today is we're going to talk about the ways that climate change and activities of the fossil fuel industry negatively impact human health, both locally and globally. <clears throat> we'll describe ways that climate change worsens health inequities, and we'll talk about ways to integrate climate change into your patient counseling efforts and also into your advocate efforts. Um, I really believe that we have a number of issues that, that we need to tackle as, as clinicians. And so I like to talk about ways that we can do that, whether we're working with our patients um, within our communities or on a policy level. And no financial conflicts, and just to disclose. Um, and I, I just wanted to start with this graphic um, from the Lancet Countdown. Um, and, and what we're really facing in this moment in time is what kind of world do we want to create? Do we want to create a world where children can merely survive or do we want to create a world where children can thrive? Um, as Sohil mentioned, I, I studied environmental science. Um, I studied ecology evolution in, in college. And um, 20 years ago, when we were thinking about climate change, we thought about it as something that is in the distant future for the polar bears. Um, and now we understand that climate change is here, it is now, it is us. Um, it is playing out in every corner of this earth. I saw a study that said that around 80% of the world has already been affected by climate change. We are seeing the effects of it right now. It is not something that exists anymore in the distant future. And it is us. Um, multiple um, medical journals and health professionals understand climate change to be the greatest single determinant of health in the 21st century. So we understand now that this isn't just something that's far away. It is something that will profoundly shape the, the life of every child that is born today. Along those lines, um, last September, 200 major medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, BMJ, and the Lancet, this was unprecedented. They coordinated this international effort to publish the same editorial on the same day across all of their publications, calling climate change the greatest threat to public health in the 21st century, and calling upon our elected officials to do more. There's also a broad consensus across medical organizations. Um, I, I'm at the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has been one of the leaders, um, but you can see multiple other, both public health and medical societies understand climate change to be a profound um, human health threat. Um, I'm going to refer to this graphic a little bit later, but I just want to set the foundation for this. So I would imagine um, most of us on this call sit either within the very concerned or somewhat concerned category in terms of climate change, which is around 75% of the country. But then look at this gap. There are so many of us that are concerned about climate change. But when you ask if we think others are concerned, you can see that we most of us don't think that others um, are concerned or care about it. And if I had to hypothesize why, I think it's because climate change feels like this big big and overwhelming problem where people don't even know where to begin. So it's almost easier to not talk about it, you know, kind of put it under the rug and, 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 and maybe it'll go away. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's an important mindset to understand in terms of concrete actions that we can take as individuals. Um, before I dive into climate change and health, I just want to give a brief primer on why this moment in terms of human civilization is so profoundly important. So if we look back 10,000 years, um, you can see we entered a, a period of pretty remarkable time 
temperature stability um, over the last 10,000 years. And, and with that base, before this, that we had a major ice age. And with that, this period of temperature stability really allowed the Earth uh, to, 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 to happen from here was that we settled into more or less predictable seasons throughout the world. So you knew if you lived in one part of the world, um, when it would be warm, when it would be cold within certain bounds of, of that, what that warmth or coldness would look like. And of course, uh, you know, every decade or two decades, there might be some freak event, but more or less the earth settled into some patterns of predictability. What this allowed for basically was agriculture, which more or less came across, came about at the same time in various parts of the world, because again, you could predict um, what could grow in what places at what times, and at the point where we could grow lots of food, with it came lots of people. So as civilization continued to grow, we had to find ways to actually power our civilization, and fossil fuels became a very cheap, um, plentiful way to do that. Um, this is an article from um, the 1900s, early 1900s, that basically predicts even as far back as then someone understood that if we were going to burn all of this coal, um, pump all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, this was going to present a problem down the line. And sure enough, here we are. So this is looking back about a million years in terms of what um, the carbon dioxide has been in our atmosphere. And you can see again that there's been some amount of fluctuation, but in the last, particularly in the last 150 years, we start to see this shooting up upward trajectory of what our carbon dioxide is. And we have never seen carbon dioxide in our history shoot up this quickly. What this has done essentially is it has destabilized our global atmosphere. So gone is the predictability. This is why you can expect a heat wave in Canada. You can expect a polar vortex in Texas. Um, we no longer can we count on um, what temperatures or what type of weather patterns are going to exist in what place. Now, when all of human civilization, our, our infrastructure, the food we grow, all of this is built around some degree of predictability. This is why we're seeing natural disaster after natural disaster play out the way, way it has. It's because we're just not prepared for how rapidly we've altered our environment. When we look across what the cause of this is, um, so I've, I've mentioned carbon dioxide, methane is another potent gas. Those are really um, two of the most potent emissions that are warming our atmosphere quite quickly. And you can see it's our energy consumption, which is our biggest one. So the energy used in our buildings to heat or cool them, our transportation systems in the US is the big chunk of our emissions in terms of our gas powered cars and trucks. Um, and then energy use in industry as well. And then you can see a smaller subset are things like agriculture, waste, and industry as well. This is just a video um, getting back to this point of, of, of predictability um, and how that, that's, that's more or less gone in variability. So um, this is looking at um, global mean surface temperatures over the last 100 years. And as I mentioned, you know, sometimes things might get a little bit warmer, but they fall back down to a baseline. So places that were blue that light up to yellow would come back down to blue. But as we get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, you'll see places that were blue turn yellow, stay the yellow, then become orange, then become red, as we're seeing places get warmer and warmer with time. Um, as I mentioned, I, I um, got my start really as an ecologist, um, and so I, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about this, but I do want to mention that um, we are, we the, the scale of, of change that's happening is, is really stripping our natural ecosystems of their ability to survive. Um, there was a there was a really interesting article in the front page of the New York Times about what's happening in the Amazon uh, with the election of Bolsonaro. He's basically taken away um, any any real enforcement around deforestation and parts of the Amazon. Um, the predictions are that if the pace of deforestation and warming continues, the Amazon will reach a tipping point and will basically turn into savanna, um, probably by middle of the century at the pace that we're going. Um, Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets are collapsing. If anybody saw this coverage of this is zombie ice sheet that's coming out of Greenland, we can expect, regardless of what we do, um, this new study that's coming out is saying we can expect at least a foot of sea level rise because of how quickly the Greenland ice sheets are collapsing. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is dying. Um, some predictions I've seen in terms of our coral reefs at the rate of warming of our oceans is somewhere between 10 to 15 years before we can expect um, most of our coral reefs to, dis to disappear. In terms of the human disasters of climate change, um, so there is severe and ongoing drought in many parts of the country, including places like Madagascar, where 1 million people are on the brink of starvation. Many island nations are likely to disappear in our lifetime because of sea level rise. 
Um, finally, today, it's front, front page coverage, what's been going on in Pakistan, but this has been going on for weeks. 33 million people have been, been displaced by historic monsoons, where they've had 190% of their usual rainfall. Um, and it's been a combination of a really terrible monsoon season with glaciers that have been melting because of climate change. I think they estimate, the estimate is that a thousand people are dead. It is likely even higher than that and 33 million people displaced by it. And if you haven't seen the coverage of this, it it, it is, it, you, it can, it can't even be comprehended um, how much of Pakistan is underwater right now. Um, last December, I don't know if folks are following this coverage, um, there was a, a swath of, of tornadoes that went across um, the Southeast United States. Now, it's really dicey to connect this to climate change. Um, tornadoes is something that we're still working out what the links are. But what was inarguable is that what spurred these tornadoes was a um, swath of warmer air that basically triggered it because you don't expect that kind of warm air during December time. And then um, there were um, once again unprecedented heat waves. Yeah, I'm just in Europe, listening to a presentation. Uh, in parts of Europe um, this summer, so in Spain and Portugal and France, not only was there unprecedented heat, there were also areas that weren't um, accustomed to getting wildfires that experienced wildfire this year as well. Um, this the group um, that basically puts out it's a, it's a group of, of um, highly respected scientists around the world that come together to put out this report. Uh, it's called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, the last report they came out with last year basically is called um, it a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. And you might have heard this number before, um, the internationally agreed threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius is perilously close. This is the, the threshold at which our scientists have determined we cannot cross. Um, after we cross the 1.5 degree threshold, we can adapt. There will be a certain amount of human health harms that we will need to adapt to, uh, but the consensus is that we can reasonably adapt to those harms. Past 1.5, um, all bets are off in terms of, uh, of our ability to, uh, to adapt and how, how quickly we can, run, we can end up in a scenario of runaway warming um, that will make multiple part, many parts of the earth inhabitable or very unhealthy to exist in. Uh, and so why, what, what does this threshold mean in terms of hard numbers? Um, I like this graphic from our World um, Wildlife Fund that talks about the amount of harm we can expect at 1.5 degrees. And so just a few numbers here to point out, you know, we'll lose somewhere between 70 and 90% of our coral reefs, but we will be able to save some. One billion people will be exposed to severe heat waves every five years. Uh, but if we get up to past 1.5 degrees of warming, you can see we will lose essentially all of our coral reefs. 2.7 billion people will be exposed to severe heat waves every five years. Um, as we think about global action and, and the role of the United States, so I did a lot of work um, internationally before I really shifted entirely domestically, and that was intentional as somebody who cares about global health, it's because the United States has historically contributed the most in terms of emissions, and our leadership on this issue sets the stage for what's going to happen in the rest of the world. Um, and so I've, I've now moved all my efforts um, to really advocating for climate policy in the United States, understanding that if we can do this here, we can really move other countries to do the same, and it is our moral obligation to do so, given how much we've contributed to the problem. Um, it was bleak from 2016 to 2020, not going to lie. And then um, we, in 2020, we had a new administration come in who um, the President Biden signed the executive order to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. And the biggest victory that we were celebrating, again, this summer, many of us um, were quite pessimistic about our um, our commitments, that we would meet our commitments in the Paris Climate Accord. And we, we none of us expected it, um, but we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, with, which if you aren't familiar with it, although it is called the Inflation Reduction Act, it is the most significant piece of climate legislation that the United States has ever passed. Um, and it puts us within, uh, we, we say field goal distance. So um, it doesn't get us all the way there in terms of meeting our commitments, but it gets us about 40% of the way there. Um, and, and now we have another 10% another to go. So it is an amazing victory and, and we feel re-energized in the movement because of it. 
Okay, so now let's shift to talking about climate change and health. So if I had like all day, we would go over all of these, but I only have an hour. So I'm gonna just focus on the top two issues and, and it's for two reasons. One, um, I like to make climate change personal to each of us. And these two issues are playing out um, in California. So it's important in terms of your personal health with your family members and with your patients as well. But these two issues are also global issues. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we bring a global health lens to these issues. But I don't wanna minimize any of these other um, problems. So severe weather, um, we're seeing more and more injuries, fatalities, loss of homes. We're seeing the mental health impacts of people that have been displaced from their homes and aren't able to return um, environmental degradation. So forced migration um, in the in situation of Pakistan, where we have tons of millions of people, Bangladesh has also experienced uh, historic um, rains this year. We're going to see more and more people moving around to places that are habitable. In California, we're already seeing that as well. Place, parts of the Central Valley have experienced such severe drought that people just can't live there anymore. And people are starting to move out of these places degraded living um, conditions and social inequities. For anybody that's been following what's been happening in Louisiana, um, there's a town there called Lake Charles that has been pounded by one hurricane after another the last few years. And all of this on top of um, a chemical plant that exploded. And I think this was in 2020, right after a hurricane blew through. And so these are communities that are dealing with one environmental disaster after another, and they can barely recover before the next one comes in and knocks them down. Changes in vector ecology. Um, so as places get warmer and certain places have more precipitation, it will be a, a beautiful breeding ground for mosquitoes and we'll see a spread of things like malaria, dengue, and encephalitis. Water and food supply impacts. Um, the city of Jacksonville in Mississippi, a, a capital city in the United States, currently has a threatened water supply because of flooding there. And so people don't have access to safe drinking water. And it's an issue we're seeing play out in, in other places as well. Um, and, and that causes um, water quality impacts. So we'll see the spread of diarrheal illnesses for like things like cholera as well. So I want to first talk a little bit about heat um, and give some concrete examples of how climate change is playing out on health and, and what it means for us as healthcare providers. Um, if folks are following the, the heat dome that happened last um, uh, last summer in Oregon and Washington, this is when temperatures topped 115, 116 degrees in Oregon and Washington, which wasn't really isn't adapted to dealing with that kind of heat. And this is some reporting that came out of the Washington Post. Physicians raced to provide fluids to patients who arrived breathless, dizzy, and drenched in sweat. Others were brought in on stretchers, their body temperatures so high, their central nervous systems had shut down. Those who could still speak told of stifling apartments and sun that made their skin sizzle. Some had tried to walk to county cooling shelters only to collapse in the blistering heat. So they've actually done studies on, on what is the upper limit that the human body can handle physiologically. Um, and a human body can handle 115 degrees with minimal humidity, wearing light clothing, at rest, drinking water continuously. And it, it reached 116 degrees in Portland, Oregon. Um, and this event is basically was impossible without climate change. Um, they expect that this event that usually happened on the scale of once every few hundreds of years, if climate change continues at its pace, can be expected to happen on a scale of uh, once every 20 to 30 years. Um, the heat waves that happened in the Pacific Northwest, um, they were new to the Pacific Northwest, but are not new to other parts of the world. Um, so this is a, a, a road in India that has been warped from the extreme heat in India this past summer as well, ex ex experienced extraordinarily high levels of heat. Um, uh, this uh, and, and, and basically what we can um, what we see in terms of uh, morbidity from this, if a morbidity mortality is if climate change goes unmitigated, deaths from heat globally could be on par with deaths from all infectious diseases combined um, by the end of the century. When we think about who's the most vulnerable, um, especially as we think about it on a global scale, um, we understand that those who are experiencing poverty, and especially people who are living in urban areas are, because um, urban areas tend to be hotter, are will be more vulnerable during peri periods of heat. Um, this is a, a paper by Ali Zeta et al. Um, that basically showed that people's average heat wave exposure in the 2010s was 40% greater than in the wealthiest quarter. So 2.4 billion person days of heat wave exposure per year compared to 1.7 billion. 
when we think about um, vulnerability, um, I like to kind of divide it into three buckets. So uh, what is your exposure to heat? What is your sensitivity to it? And what is your adaptive capacity? And so we know certain populations will have higher levels of exposure to heat. Um, so we think about people who are experiencing housing insecurity, outdoor workers, um, athletes or incarcerated individuals. Um, certain populations are physiologically more vulnerable to heat. So um, the elderly infants in particular, and particularly in the first week of life, individuals who are pregnant, um, those with mental disability, those that are taking um, life-saving medications or um, are utilizing medical equipment, and then those that can actually adapt to the heat. And, and this is a little bit what the prior graphic gets to. So if you um, are elderly, but you live in an air-conditioned home, um, you are less likely to be vulnerable than um, if you're elderly and living in a place where you don't have access to cooling, or you may not be able to afford running your air conditioner, even if you have one. Um, people who are socially isolated, and so we've seen this in places like New York um, and Europe, it was elderly living alone um, that didn't have anybody to turn to that had higher risks of, of dying during heat waves. People who don't speak the local or prevailing language may not receive the emergency alerts or the alerts on how to stay safe. Um, and then people that are not um, accustomed to, to periods of extreme heat. Interlaced into all of this, so I've talked a little bit about physiology in terms of vulnerability, and then there are those who are made vulnerable by racism and poverty, and the heat wave in Chicago is a very good example of this. So um, in 1995, Chicago experienced a heat wave, and there were a disproportionate number of Black Americans who died during this heat wave. Um, they went back and, and interviewed community members to understand um, what the factors were behind that. Many people in the neighborhoods where there was a higher mortality reported not being safe so much as opening their window to cool down in their neighborhoods because they lived in an area that, that was over-policed. So people literally baked inside of their, their apartments and their homes. When we think about the Bay Area um, and how uh, an adaptation, um, so as we think about things like access to cooling, which is a big predictor in terms of your ability to stay safe during periods of heat. Uh, and again, this gets back to how we built our infrastructure and systems to, you know, to, to account for the environment or the climate that we live in. I grew up in Houston, so I would grow from my air conditioned home to my air conditioned car to my air conditioned school. Um, but you can see in places like San Francisco and Seattle, historically, we just haven't needed um, access to cooling on a broad scale because this, these have been places that historically had more temperate climates. Um, but we're increasingly seeing more and more heat waves coming through Northern California. And our counties, fortunately, are starting to recognize this for the problem it is and are putting more and more resources into um, cooling centers where communities can go, understanding that getting air conditioning into every house in the immediate um, future is going to be difficult to do, but eventually we're probably going to have to go there. Um, you compound this with the housing crisis that we have in Northern California. Uh, this isn't by percentage, this is, this is um, hard numbers in terms of the number of individuals who are experiencing housing insecurity. But we, we saw terrible examples of this the year the pandemic started. We had a historic year of heat waves, of wildfires, and we had areas of informal cooling like movie theaters and public libraries that were shut down. And so people literally had nowhere to go um, to stay safe. And that's what really mobilized our counties to start to do more around it. Um, when we think about heat, so there's both the, I've, I've mentioned the exposure to heat in terms of what the ambient temperature is, but um, interlaced with all of this is our built environment. Urbanized areas are measurably hotter, between one to seven degrees higher than outlying areas. Um, and, and so, and, and this too is not accidental in terms of areas that are hotter. Um, there's good evidence in places of the US that places that have been historically redlined tend to have less in the way of green infrastructure to keep areas cool. And this is just some data out of Oakland that is showing the correlation between um, places that are hotter and places that are richer. So you can see that areas that are lower wealth um, tend to be that places that are hotter on hot days. Um, and we see the same effects play out in places like India as well. When we think about um, how populations are made vulnerable. So I'm a, I'm a pediatric um, hospitalist. I work at a small community hospital um, out in Pleasanton. Um, and, and so I, I have seen the effects of each one of these things play out. So pregnant women are at higher risk for adverse birth outcomes, including uh, low birth weight and premature um, infants. 
Um, households living in poverty may not be able to afford their energy bills for AC. Um, infants in the um, particular can't effectively thermoregulate. So, so putting those two together, I, I actually took care of uh, an infant born to um, a couple, a teenage couple, who really hung on the words that all of us said in terms of caring for their children because they were such young parents. Well, they lived in an unair conditioned apartment in Oakland during a heat wave, um, and their baby came in with severe dehydration. And on talking to them more, they had basically followed the advice of the nurse on how to dress their baby. And so they had put the baby into a onesie, into a blanket with a hat on in the middle of a heat wave, and their baby got um, very dehydrated from it. And they were so tearful, and like we did everything we were told. We're not bad parents. I'm like, of course, you're not bad parents. Um, and it was it was a really sobering moment to understand that we as health prof professionals really haven't been trained to think about the environmental threats to our family, families. And then outdoor workers may not have protections in place. So two years ago now, we had a really severe heat wave. I cared for a 16-year-old who had come here unaccompanied from Mexico who took a job um, hauling brick in 100 degree weather um, and came in with severe rhabdomyolysis. His um, creatinine had tripled. Now he was 16. So we were able to reverse that pretty quickly with some, some aggressive rehydration. But we know from the evidence that outdoor workers that experience this kind of insult to the kidney again and again and again from being in these working conditions can end up with chronic kidney damage down the line. And last year, unfortunately, um, during the heat wave in Oregon, a farm worker um, collapsed and died in the heat. Um, and it took that um, for that for the state of Oregon to start passing more laws around protecting outdoor workers during periods of extreme heat. Any questions on heat before I turn to wildfires? So these are pictures from Paradise. Um, that was the Paradise fires in 2018. And, and at the time um, when, I, when I had made this presentation to put these pictures up, these pictures felt remarkable then. Um, and what is remarkable to me is how unremarkable they feel now um, because we've been living, we've been seeing more and more destruction. And, and I, I, I feel as though we've almost become somewhat numb to this because we're seeing this year after year after year. Um, on the left here is the San Francisco skyline on top. Um, um, and below it is the same skyline um, with pollution from, um, from the, the Paradise wildfires. Uh, the pollution on those days basically rivaled places, um, some of the most polluted cities in places like India and China um, that don't have the same regulations that we have. In the middle here, we have um, just the scenes of destruction that I think we've all seen. Um, Paradise was pretty much entirely leveled by that fire. And then on the right, and again, this was remarkable that year, but but we've seen pretty overwhelming fires now. So this no longer feels as remarkable was that we could actually see these smoke plumes from space. They were so big and so overwhelming. Well, um, a few, you know, I, I think this has more or less died down, but um, when we started to experience more and more destructive fires, there was a lot going around in the media about how it's not because of climate change, it's because California doesn't do good land management. Land management is certainly a part of the equation, will need to be a part of the solution, um, but the intensity, frequency, and duration are absolutely driven by climate change. We are seeing hotter days um, that's basically drying out our precipitation and unprecedented mega drought. And when you hear people who have been on the ground when these fires break out, they literally they describe it as like, it sounds like a bomb going out because the, the vegetation is so dry, it takes spark and, and just starts spreading very quickly from there. Um, in terms of what California has experienced in, in, in heat waves, um, we every year you can see that the slope is basically going upwards as we're um, burning more and more acres per year. In 2020, 4 million acres burned in California. I believe the count from 2021 was 2.9 million acres burned, um, so higher than usual, um, but not, not as high as 2020. Wildfires, again, are not just an issue that um, exists in California. Last year, we saw record-breaking heat waves in Italy, Greece, and Turkey this past summer. Um, there were also unprecedented heat waves in Spain, Portugal, and France. Um, and then last year as well, um, the permafrost went ablaze with hundreds of wildfires in the world's coldest region of the world. Um, if carbon emissions continue unabated, we can expect a 74% increase in the frequency of wildfires by the end of the century, and it's projected, um, if we do not take action, which the, the world looks more optimistic on that front, that wildfire smoke could be the most predominant form of air pollution that we're breathing by the end of the century for how much could potentially be on fire. And, 
and why why um, do we care about wildfire smoke? Um, I'll talk a little bit about the um, the implications in terms of mental health and displacement, but I want to talk a little bit first about the smoke itself. So um, for those who are not familiar, and, and this too, you know, I'm an environmental scientist, so obviously I bring my own bias to this, but per particulate matter is something that I think every single health professional should know something about. Particulate matter is um, what we breathe in when we burn anything, whether we're breathing, burning fossil fuels or when a wildfire breaks out and, and you know, and burns an entire town. Um, basically all those particles, um, they can combine with liquid and um, make these tiny, tiny little droplets, make them still be the fraction of a human hair. And they're so tiny, we can breathe them in, they enter our body, into our vasculature, and basically set off the equivalent of an inflammatory cascade within our bodies. This graphic down here um, that um, pollution matters, and it, it talks about exposure to, to PM or, or particulate matter pollution, um, basically increases your risk for a shorter life, for stroke, heart disease, asthma, lung cancer, reduced lung function, low birth weight. Now, we know this quite well because we've been studying fossil fuel pollution for a long time. So this is based off of fossil fuel pollution. Wildfire smoke is 10 times more harmful to health compared to um, traditional fossil fuel pollution. Um, so the fact that we're being exposed to this year after year um, for multiple weeks of a year is, is deeply concerning, especially for um, three populations, um, young children, um, pregnant individuals, and the elderly. And that's what this tweet gets to. This is um, Kate Brown's tweet. Um, from the state of Oregon, um, that just like some public health messaging around, you know, who who should be concerned in terms of their health. Uh, what we see during periods of wildfire smoke is we see more episodes of asthma, we see more lower um, respiratory infections, and then we're beginning to see uh, more and more evidence emerging about the exposure to wildfire smoke and adverse birth outcomes as well. I mentioned before, um, you know, wildfire smoke is much more toxic, but we are always breathing in the fossil fuel pollution um, that results in these very disparate outcomes. And so if we look at some of these statistics, a Hispanic child is twice as likely to die from asthma compared to a non-Hispanic white child. Black children are four times as likely to die from asthma compared to white children. Um, what's behind the, those these enormous and unjust um, inequities? So one, we take the fact that um, our sites of fossil fuel extraction, combustion, and refining are not accidental. We looked at the Chavon refinery in Richmond, where a third of the population is African American, or we look to the freeway around Oakland um, that was basically built. West Oakland used to be a previously thriving African American community that got encircled by a freeway uh, to privilege white suburban commuters that were coming in for work, throwing that air pollution into the children that were living um, within that rain. So we take that first, um, that we tend to build in just polluting industries around low wealth um, communities and communities of color. We compound that. With, with other social determinants. So Black family is less likely to be able to afford their prescription medications um, for asthma. And then we add an implicit bias um, in our, the, our medical care of our patients. And you see these entirely unjust outcomes where a Black child is four times as likely to die from asthma compared to a white child. Um, and again, it is like my personal mission that every single health professional understand the effects of par particulate matter and fossil fuel air pollution, which is responsible for one in five deaths worldwide, around 8 million deaths per year are driven by, uh, by fossil fuel pollution, which is why um, I am so passionate about us getting off fossil fuels, not only because it is ruining our planet in terms of climate change, but because when we burn it, um, we pollute our air um, and, it, and it causes health outcomes that are entirely preventable. I've talked a lot about pollution. The last piece of wildfires that I want to talk about um, is the displacement and the mental health piece. Um, so this, I, I really appreciate this framework that was put together by Davies at all in terms of thinking about our communities that um, will experience greater vulnerability to wildfires, both right when the wildfire happens and then in terms of their ability to recover afterwards. So they, they created this nice wheel in terms of thinking about um, which, which of our families or patients might be more vulnerable. So families living in poverty may not be able to afford brush clearing. Families without cars may not be able to flee. Native Americans in this country have a six times higher vulnerability because of their historical forts concentration on federal reservations. And then non-English speaking residents are at higher risk because they may not receive the information. And we saw two episodes of this um, in Sonoma County. They basically only sent out alert um, evacuation alerts in English to a population where about a third of the population spoke Spanish. So people did not get those alerts in a language that they um, that they understood. 
And then um, there was reporting on um, wildfire that broke out in Colorado, where um, the, the authorities went around knocking on people's doors, asking them to evacuate. And families, some families thought that it was ICE that was coming to try to take away their family members. So they didn't even open the door. Um, and again, thinking about how our, our, our other racist policies um, can, can really profoundly shape the behaviors of our family and make them, and make them unsafe in these circumstances. And then the final piece of wildfires is our mental health. So, so again, I'm a, I'm a pediatrician um, and um, we have come to understand particularly in the last 20 or 20 years what the effect of toxic stress and adverse childhood events means on a child's lifetime of health. Understanding that each of these toxic stresses, the more that a child racks up in their lifetime, places them at much higher risk down the line for a variety of chronic um, medical conditions, um, heart, heart disease, cardiovascular outcomes, diabetes, and, and mental illness as well. And so we really, you know, as pediatricians, we work hard to ensure that children can thrive from the very beginning to minimize what these toxic stresses can be. So things like um, poverty, housing insecurity, food insecurity, a caretaker that has mental illness themselves. What climate change does is it takes each of these determinants and significantly worsens them. Um, we understand that children need safe, st stable, and nurturing environments to thrive, and these types of disasters basically repeatedly expose children to these events and, and, and basically compound each of these risks for things like poverty, um, food insecurity, and mental illness in a caregiver. Um, for those who are not familiar with Mona Hanna Atisha's work, she is a pediatrician um, who worked in Flint, Michigan, and, and basically was, was one of the people that discovered uh, the higher levels of lead um, in, in the children in her, her practice, and then it led her to, to start inquiring why that, why that was the case, and then they discovered the issues with Flint's water supply. She wrote this really great piece um, in the New York Times talking about children's resilience, and she's talking about environmental pollution like lead, but I think this applies for climate change as well. She wrote, the will to survive and endure can be the deciding factor between a child who overcomes adversity and thrives and a child who never makes it to adulthood. But how long can we ask people born in the wrong zip code to rise above and persevere in circumstances beyond their control, no matter how central the idea of overcoming is to our archetypal American identity? And so I, I am just tired of, of asking our children to be resilient um, because I don't think that should be the question. We shouldn't ask how resilient our children are. We should be asking, why are we still reliant upon fossil fuels that is ruining our health when it is entirely preventable? Okay. I know I've maybe depressed the crap out of all of you, but climate change is a big problem, and I don't want to diminish that, but I also want to, to posit that it is both our greatest health threat and our greatest health opportunity, uh, and this is a, a cartoon um, basically saying, you know, what is a big hoax, and we create a better world for nothing, but all of these things are worth imagining and fighting for, and, and that's what really drives me in climate change, is that we, we've made a lot of mistakes, we've caused a lot of damage, but we can use that in this moment to actually create a world that we can feel proud of. Um, I got my start in all of this by reading a lot of Carl Sagan. And um, for any who've been um, following the new uh, web telescope and some of the images coming out of it, it, it really drives this profound sense that the earth is so special and unique. Um, and that, that too keeps me going in this work. And I love this quote from Carl Sagan. He wrote, from this distant vantage point, the earth might not seem of particular interest, but for us, it's different. Consider again that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us, on it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar and supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in the sunbeam. So I take a large step back um, and think about our, our big, beautiful, special world. And then I take a big step forward in, and these are my two kids um, in terms of what really motivates me and keeps me going in this work. When I talk to others you know, about what keeps us going in the movement, it's, it's that climate change feels almost like a big bus barreling down on our children. And, and what would we do but throw ourselves in front of that bus um, if it's for our kids? Okay, so when radical change is needed, many argue that it's impossible for individual action to drive it, it's futile for anyone to try. This is completely the opposite of the truth. The impotence of individual action is a reason for everyone to try. So let's talk about 
what we can do. Um, for climate change, really, the, the, the big lever here is policy. Climate change is a systemic problem um, where we need systemic solutions. And, and so I'll talk a little bit about our individual actions, but um, I like to think about um, as people get involved in climate change as sort of a ladder of engagement. You, you start by doing some things individually, and then you pretty quickly see that these are much bigger problems that can be done individually. But start individual and then work yourself up to, to policy, because that's where we really, really need to drive, drive our changes. So first, um, I don't know how many of you have seen this graphic before, but I want to empower each of you to understand that health professionals are deeply trusted to the public. Um, we live in a very messy and confusing media landscape. Um, and even with all of that, uh, all that's going around, nurses, medical doctors, and pharmacists are you know, three of the most trusted to the public in terms of, of, of who they want to hear information from. So we can actually use um, our ability, our, our, our role as trusted messengers to effectively counsel on adaptation behaviors and build will and conscientiousness for the policies we need to transition off of fossil fuels. So what can you do on an individual level um, for your patients? <clears throat> First is we're thinking about things like heat waves. Um, you can know where to refer your patients for emergency services like cooling centers. It'll depend on the county where you're where you are. Uh, San Francisco is doing a better and better job at this. They now have this new um, emergency sort of center for anything where they would put out an alert, including around a heat wave, uh, where you can look to see what what services are being offered. I think Alameda County, the ones that I've seen, does the best job in terms of um, heat in particular. In terms of wildfires, you can do individual counseling with your families on how to stay safe uh, during periods of uh, poor air quality. So these are just some basic counseling items that you can do with your families. Um, you know, choosing a room where people spend a majority of their time um, and closing off the windows, um, using if they have an individual, a portable air purifier, using that portable air purifier. I work the with a number of families that are struggling even to put food on the table. So I will give them um, this option of a DIY filter that you can do for, for $20, um, which reduces air pollution inside the house by about 50 to 60 percent. Increasingly, our counties are starting to do prescription air purifier programs. And so being aware within your county, if such a program exists, to, to uh, be able to refer your families to, the, to um, those programs so they can get an air purifier um, if they're eligible for one. Um, I think we all know about masks, what works for the pandemic works for wildfires, so N95s. Um, surgical masks do offer some amount of protection. Um, but really, again, much like the pandemic, it's all about the fit. Uh, so the better the fit, the better protection you'll get from, from the wildfire smoke. But this, I, you know, no sense of false reassurance here. The best thing to really do is to be inside in an area where you're able to clean air. If you have to go outside with an N95, it should be for brief periods of time, uh, for periods of wildfire smoke. We can also talk to our patients and counsel them about climate change. So um, I'm a hospitalist. Um, I'll say the way that I do my counseling with families around climate change is that I talk to all my newborn families about, um, about heat and how to, how to keep their infants safe during periods of heat. I talk to all my asthmatic families about wildfire smoke um, and ways to keep an indoor um, clean air environment. Um, at times, you know, when I have to go in to do counseling for a premature uh, birth for a mom that's about to give uh, birth to a premature infant, and she, or he, they, and they ask me, uh, you know, why did this happen? I might put in a bit about the role that climate change is playing um, in terms of, of premature birth outcomes. Those are the ways that I work climate change into my counseling. Um, this is a more of a primary care perspective. Um, you know, if you're doing in, you're doing counseling around nutrition, for example, you can talk about plant based options. Um, if you're talking about physical activity, you can talk about um, how active transportation is good for your health and decreasing your carbon footprint. Um, and then you, um, in terms of uh, our families that are experiencing housing insecurity, it's important to check in about their ability to be in places where they can stay cool. And then again, there are resources for energy bill weatherization exists. I will be honest with you, I've looked into some of these. It is a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, and so it's a good resource to be aware of, but I, but um, often some of these resources are very hard to access for families to be, to be perfectly honest. Um, on an interpersonal level. So um, if you decide to take some action, you're deciding to, to bike more often, uh, you're deciding to eat more plant forward foods, um, you live either in a building or you are a homeowner and you can install solar panels, well, that's great. 
take that individual action, but more importantly, tell other people that you're doing it. Back to that graphic at the beginning, how many of us are worried and how often we think others are not worried. I think the most important thing that we can do is to talk about climate change. So don't just take that action, but make sure you're telling your friends, your colleagues, your patients um, what you're doing and why you're doing it. So we've talked about the personal and I wanna to shift to sort of the organizational. Uh, this was super exciting this year. The, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services launched a pledge um, to mobilize the healthcare sector to reduce emissions. Uh, Stanford, UCSF have signed this pledge. Um, but now you have an opportunity to press your leaders on how they're going to meet their commitments for this pledge. And I think I think I put aside in at the end, we do a yearly NorCal symposium with our healthcare CEOs. Uh, the new UCSF CEO will be joining us. So if you are able to join our conversation at 4 p.m. on September 23rd, you can hear how your CEO at UCSF is planning on meeting these commitments. Um, this is a midterm year, so get registered, vote, um, and get others to vote as well. Um, bonus uh, to vote for elected leaders with plans as bold as the problem is big. Um, there are so many things you can do this year because it is an election year that is deeply important to climate change. You can go to an event with candidates running during the midterms and press them on their solutions. We at the consortium have this whole guide that you can actually use um, to press the candidates on what they're doing for climate change. Um, and, and, and really, this is a, a year where we really need to build upon the momentum created by the Inflation Reduction Act. We still have a ways to go. Um, we risk we losing a number of seats in Congress um, for, by, of decision makers who would be willing to pass climate legislation. So this is an important year to get out the boat for health. Oh, and then for those who are not familiar with VoteER, highly plug this resource as well. This is nonpartisan. It's a lanyard that you can wear that helps your patients get registered to vote. It's a great conversation starter, and it's a great way um, to increase access to the vote. Um, and, and the reason why um, I, the, the vote, the American Medical Association um, has finally recognized that voting is a profound social determinant of health um, and, and recognizing that our vote, who we vote for, uh, basically determines what policies are going to be passed. And these policies determine our health. Um, so as, as a good, this is a, a, a site of fossil fuel extraction here in California that is right next to a home. Um, and things like this are allowed because we have not elected decision makers who, who can pass policies that better protect health. Um, and so that's why it's really important to talk about climate change as a health issue and voting as a health issue because the people that we elect into power basically determine our health by the policies that they pass. Other things you can do, you can join a group. Um, this is how I got my start. Um, I started working first with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and then I started working with other local groups like Climate Health Now and Physicians for Social Responsibility, um, where you can learn how to write an op-ed, how to advocate to your decision makers. This is a bunch of us doing a legislative visit together, and then how to strike or march for change. Um, met multiple medical societies are now very active in climate change, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, and CMA has become very active in this area as well. Um, so there are multiple opportunities, depending on what your medical specialty is, to get involved. As I mentioned, um, our symposium is going to be at the end of uh, this year, uh, sorry, at the, on September 23rd. The CEO panel is at the end of the day at 4 p.m. Our registration, I think, is going live today. Um, but you can see our website is down here if you wanted to register and join us for any or part of the day to be able to learn more. Um, unfortunately, I, um, I wish I could talk like for three more hours about climate change, but I did want to just open up some time for questions because I know I've presented you all with a lot of information. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate your, your wisdom, insights, and passion for this issue. I think some of the lessons you provide are big policy pieces, uh, but also the very tangible steps all of us can take. So I appreciate both of those lenses on this. Um, as Lisa mentioned, the floor is open for questions. Uh, so feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to kick things off unless there are others who have a question. Pause a second. Um, so um, we have some colleagues on the line from Uganda, and this morning we were having a conversation um, around really, you know, who sets the rules and the agenda uh, within global health. Um, and also with that, the, the understanding and realization that um, uh, the, 
the playing field isn't level, right? For for every every nation as we're getting to this stage. And so uh, some nations are undergoing their various iterations of let's say industrial revolutions or trying to ramp up infrastructure and capacity in different ways. Um, so as you think about these large climate bills and even individual actions in nations where resources are different or where goals and desires are different, how do you, you know, how do you reconcile the, the importance of, of action in some of those settings? Does that make sense? It does. Uh, and I think it is tough from place to place. I don't know what what um, I was watching a bunch of the appeals from the various ministers in Pakistan for help. Um, and how do we compel places like the US to pay for what they've done? Um, you know, and, and I, I don't know how, um, because there I, I can't think of a way to compel um, us to pay our share. Um, and, and again, for, for those who haven't seen the, the footage coming out of Pakistan, I'd encourage you to watch some of the news conferences with the prime ministers there who are basically saying, I mean, this the, the scale of this disaster is it's not, first of all, it's not their fault um, that this is happening to them. They don't have the resources to be able to recover from something like this. And it should absolutely be something that's paid for um, by the places that have polluted the most. So places like the US and China. But I I don't know my way quite as well. I don't know my way around the negotiations as well for a climate fund that is being established for this purpose. But I do know that um, the amount that places like the US are committing to these is paltry compared to what they should be. Yeah, on a personal level, I entirely agree. Um, questions from others, and um, and maybe if it's okay, what I'll do is I'll call on Dr. Okello from uh, Busatema University in Uganda um, to recount a, a conversation we were having around the real world implications of climate change um, in his region uh, as recent as yesterday. Yes. Uh... Thank you so much. Uh, it was a nice uh, presentation and uh, it gave us uh, an insight indeed on what is happening in real life today. And uh, as I was sharing with Dr. Sud, uh, is that uh, recently, actually, uh, at the beginning of this month, we, we had a very terrible flood, flash floods around in, in the eastern Uganda. I think you must have read something about it. And also we are next to the, uh, the mountainous region, Mount Elgon region. So we tend to also have uh, landslides or mudslides that take place. So this time around, just next to actually around the 50 minutes drive from where I'm staying right now, uh, suddenly we have a bridge with a, we would call it, it's a river, but it has not been that big. Uh, but this time around it flooded and swept away vehicles and pedestrians. So there was a death toll of around uh, 29. If you Google, you can find it. And then 29 people died. So that one tells us that uh, climate change is real because uh, this was a short time period because the rain was just for around eight hours. It wasn't so much big, but it's indeed caused a lot of havoc here. And right now we also have displaced people uh, in, the, in the nearby districts who, who are being looked after and being uh, accommodated elsewhere because of the landslides and the mudslides. So I, I think basically the, we have an experience of late uh, this, this last year, or I would say the last two years, the, the, the dry seasons have been longer than they were before. And also the with the rainy season are shorter but heavy when they come. So either way or either side, there is damage. When they are heavy, even if they are short, they cause uh, problems. When they are uh, when there is the drought, it takes a long time and people are, are, are starved. Actually, we've had issues in, in Karamoja sub-region. I think you have also read about it. So starvation has also been one of the biggest challenges due to climate change. Uh, yesterday, actually, we had also some rain. That's why I wasn't able to attend your, uh, the lecture because once it starts raining heavily here, they load shed, they switch off the, the electricity uh, to avoid um, other accidents. So sometimes it affects our ability to access internet and power sources basically. So what you've been talking about is basically 
we are living it. It's real. Thank you so much. Well, I, I'm just curious. Um, you know, we I, I understand the U.S. context quite well, but I, I'm wondering in other places um, what what are people's perceptions of climate change and and um, how how are people thinking about addressing it in places like Uganda? Uh, I may not be in, in the very knowledgeable on the the, the recent uh, policy programs on climate change and so on, but uh, uh, it's one of the it has been it's areas of concern. If you realize that politicians now talk about it very often in the parliament, and then also uh, you realize that the university levels, it's one of the things that is coming up in discussions in various fora. And for us, for example, it's a university of um, uh, science and technology. So you realize that the agriculture bit of it, it's one of the major concerns uh, in the faculties. And they, I think they are getting to learn more about it and maybe offer uh, future solutions maybe. For the policies, I haven't read so much about the policies uh, I, 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 and I will not be really so much in position to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was just curious. I mean, I'll say uh, while we celebrate that the IRA was passed this year, I, I just also want to put into context, we're in 2022 and the U.S. government has known since 1960 um, the threat that this would face, that, that we would face. And so we basically had 60 years, 60, is that right? My math. <laughs> to do something and it took us 60 years. Um, and so we celebrate this legislation, but it also comes quite late given how long we've known that this was going to be a problem. And just to add, Dr. Patel, we actually have um, people who've called in and joined us from other countries as well. So I don't know if anyone else wants to come off mute and speak to their personal um, experience. I know Dr. Mulgado is joining us from Mexico. Um, so if anyone else wants to share as well, because I think that this is one of those things where each country kind of has a different approach and mindset. So I'd be curious to hear. And that goes for our, our U, U.S. trainees as well. Um, you know, is this? Uh, I guess I'm curious. Is this your first exposure to this topic in a healthcare context? I, I could share um, a brief experience. I think that my experience also is in a much more smaller scale, and I think is a little bit more anecdotal. Um, but um, Dr. Patel, thank you for um, your talk. And um, I actually have a pretty similar, I guess, um, background and, and interest with you uh, in the sense that I also studied um, ecological sciences in undergrad. I was a marine bio major. And what really prompted my interest in um, global health was my time in Tahiti, where even though um, for all of us who went there, our projects were mainly like conservation and more ecological in practice. I think one of the greatest benefits was that we lived on a cultural station where um, it was run by um, Tahitians. And because of that, we got very close to um, them there. And they did share a lot of insights as to how global warming is affecting their daily lives and even affecting the research that we were able to be a part of. And what I thought was very interesting was that um, French Polynesia has one of the highest rates of obesity in the world. And some, what they shared about their perspectives and how, like, why that is trending is because, one, like, largely it's because of, of global warming, um, that it has severely affected the um, population of fish in, in the coral reef ecosystem. And also with shrimp farming um, and pollution of, of the local waters, it has really dramatically decreased the amount of, of just fish that they can eat on a daily basis. And because of that, they have shifted a lot to eating more breadfruit and starch products, and also overall have adopted um, a more sedentary um, lifestyle. And there was 
some folks there who were studying um, marine anthropology and, and just seeing how global, um, how climate change has affected people's relationship with waters and their livelihoods. And I always thought that was a very um, eye-opening experience. And afterwards, I haven't seen much work. Um, I, I just haven't been able to come across more work further exploring that idea. But then I just thought that was incredibly interesting. And I just wanted to share that. Of course, this is, again, a pretty small scale and just my personal experience talking to the folks there. But yeah, this okay. is just another example of, of how global warming does this affect local population. No, I, yeah, super interesting. And uh, I, I do a few of these global health lectures for in various venues. And um, there are so many different ways that it plays out, right? I, that, that's that's what is both uh, exciting and overwhelming <laughs> about this particular topic. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Again, really appreciate the time and energy you, you put uh, into this conversation this morning. Um, would it be all right for folks to contact you if they have any follow-up questions? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, this is my email. Hold on a second. Um, I am very passionate about helping other people find their place in the movement. And I do most of my work in um, climate change, but I've done a lot of work in other areas of US-based advocacy and health. So please feel free to reach out. I'm always help, happy to help you um, think about connections or ways to get involved. Thank you. And speaking of ways to get involved, the symposium, I may have missed it, but I forget whether it's virtual or in person. It is virtual. Yes. <laughs> so so we're happy to share that information out once you said that the registration comes online. So, awesome. Um, Sounds great. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks all.